Hi, I'm Nicole Goche, uh, University of Kentucky uh, Professor of Plant Pathology. Uh, my specialty is disease management and disease diagnostics of um, hemp. So uh, this is uh, one of a series of three. They're not all required in the series, but it's helpful to have all three. Um, so we're going to talk first about disease general disease, disease 101 as I like to call it. So these are some very basic disease diagnostic, uh, disease concept, disease management uh, ideas or theories. They're going to be really important as you go along to understand um, disease and the pathogens that cause disease in your hemp or cannabis production, uh, whether it's greenhouse or field. So first of all, what is disease? The definition of disease is a malady, a disorder, or an abnormality. So we use the word disease often in our, in our everyday lives pretty loosely. So disease is something that's just not right. But here in plant pathology, we use the, the word disease very differently. So in plant pathology or in the agricultural or horticultural world, we use the word disease uh, as an abnormality caused by a disease agent or the microscopic pathogens that cause the plant to become um, diseased, if you will, or abnormal. So your typical disease agents or microbes that cause disease are fungi, water molds, bacteria, viruses, and nematodes. So um, in this series, we'll look at those a little bit closer. Keep in mind, though, that microorganisms are microscopic. That's what the name micro is referring to. And that means that you can't see them with the naked eye. I can't see them with the naked eye. They are microscopic. Therefore, we need, at the minimum, a microscope to be able to identify them. And while disease is the symptom caused by these microbes, we need to actually see the microorganism in order to diagnose it. So we can't diagnose simply by, by symptoms, but at the same time, we can't see those microbes very readily without the use of at least a microscope. Which brings me to a very important concept here, symptoms versus signs. So symptoms, that's the disease. That is that, that disorder or that abnormality we see by the plant. So disease or symptoms will be wilt or it'll be rot or it'll be blight. So it's that, it's that reaction by the plant when there is an infection. Um, in, this, in this photo, we might say the symptom is a leaf spot or the symptom is necrosis or the symptom is the chlorotic halo that's around that leaf spot. That's, that is very different than the sign the sign is when we see some structure of the of the pathogen, right? So in the center of this spot in this image, we see those little black pepper like flakes or those little pimple like flakes, um, those little structures that are raised. That is a sign. Those are called pycnidia. Um, and, and so the, the terminology is less important at this at this time. But thinking about when we see the sign, that's the fungus. That's the, that's the structure developed by the fungus. Inside those pycnidia are um, multiple spores. So there are lots of uh, fungal spores inside those pycnidia. But um, it, although that those, those um, fungal spores are too small to see individually, we do see that structure. So those are the signs. And if we don't see signs, we only see symptoms, we absolutely can't even say that we have a disease or we have a fungal disease, for example. We can only say that there's an abnormality or that there are symptoms of some sort. And over time, you'll start to notice that a lot of things may cause symptoms that look like um, a, a, a plant disease, and they may be caused by other things. Phytotoxicity, for example, will cause spots that look like a fungal leaf spot. And that's just one example. Um, overwatering can cause a root rot that looks very similar to, say, a pythium root rot caused by an oomycete or a water mold pathogen. So be careful of, of uh, mistaking symptoms as the diagnostic feature. And when you do see signs, 
that's usually a very good place to start in your disease diagnostic journey. So some plant disease 101. Um, in order to have plant disease, we need three things to happen. And any pathologist you know describes plant disease as a triangle. We call it the plant disease triangle for obvious reasons. And the premise here is that in order to have disease, you must have these three things. In order to have a triangle, you must have all three sides. So if you break one side of a triangle, you no longer have a triangle. And in that same vein, if you, if you need three things to have disease and you break one side or you remove one of those components, you can no longer have disease. So our goal in disease management is to break the disease triangle, if you will. So the three components needed um, for disease, you must have that pathogen. You must have that microscopic microorganism, a fungus, bacterium, water mold, virus, nematode, in order to have disease, or at least a, a pathogenic disease in the vein that I am talking about it today. You also must have a susceptible host, okay? So some, some pathogens are host specific. Sometimes they may only infect uh, a certain part of the plant or a certain um, uh, growth stage of the plant. So you have to have that susceptible tissue there. And if you don't have that susceptible tissue there, again, breaking aside. The one that's most easily manipulated is the environment, the third side of the disease triangle. And um, very simply put, um, all plant pathogens or most plant pathogens need two major environmental conditions to complete their life cycle. They need um, free water and moderate temperatures. Okay, so by moderate temperatures, usually in the case of 60 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit, if you're comfortable, the pathogen is comfortable. Um, now, of course, we do have more of our cool season pathogens and other times we have warm season pathogens, but they're still within that same range that humans are comfortable. So when it's freezing outside, you're not going to have disease or you're not going to have an active pathogen. If it's hot outside, that pathogen is going to shut down and go into a sort of dormancy. Um, so if you're comfortable, the pathogen is comfortable. So think about on a very hot summer day, um, maybe it's 90 degrees Fahrenheit out, out in your field or in your greenhouse, but you've got a shaded area or you've got a very dense canopy where you've got some shade and it's cooler in those microclimates. So you, that there is a temperature differential. So even if you are in a very broad, say a large field, there is a temperature differential. Cloudy days will definitely manipulate the temperature. Um, and I, I also said the second the second um, environmental condition needed is free water. And by free water, of course, that can mean rain, can mean overhead irrigation, it can mean dew, it can mean fog, um, and also relative humidity. So um, relative humidity humidity often provides enough free water for pathogens to complete their life cycle. So in terms of fungi, generally 70% humidity and up is that favorable environment for, for fungi. Um, some of them will require more water, about 85% relative humidity. Um, your water mold, so your uh, phytophthoras, your um, downy mildews, generally in the area of 85% humidity. And then your bacteria, typically 85% relative humidity. So always monitoring your humidity, knowing what your humidity is, very closely monitoring that in the greenhouse, exchanging air when necessary. But in the field, think about microclimates, think about summer rains or cloudy days, or maybe a part of the field that gets um, morning shade where leaves don't dry the, uh, the dew off quick enough, uh, those types of things. Those are the microclimates where we can see those environmental conditions that are conducive for disease. So the three components together, the pathogen, susceptible host, and that favorable environment are all needed to have disease. Again, the disease triangle, keep it in your head. It's really helpful as you, you um, are trying to manage disease, especially without the use of pesticides. So let's switch gears just a little bit. So if you are on site, so I'm generalizing here, whether you're out in the field 
or you're in a greenhouse or maybe an indoor environment. Um, so if there is a problem, if you suspect a disease or if you suspect a, some type of disorder, you've got to be able to, to triage, if you will. So we'll call this on-site diagnostics. This is not a substitute for using a plant disease diagnostic lab, someone with a microscope or molecular techniques to identify the specific pathogen. This is your, this is your first step. These are the things that every grower needs to do before they contact um, their diagnostic lab or their county agent. So this is the data collecting phase. And very often it will help you identify things, not the pathogen, but if there are other abiotic or other problems going on, this is the, uh, this is the way that often you can identify those things. So step one, step back. What's happening? What's there? What does the site look like? Um, Sometimes we start by looking really closely. We look at that leaf spot or we look at that wilted plant very closely, but we don't step back to see what the big picture looks like. So, so step back, look at your field as a whole. What's going on? Uh, this image here, there's a low spot. And of course, this is an extreme example, but this is a real situation. So stepping back. So if we were to have problems in this field, we would expect that they would start in that section that, that holds water. You might also look at the soil all around and um, you see there are some small weeds there. Well, they are, they are blighting or they are dying. So it looks like an herbicide was applied there. So step back, look at other plants around, look at the soil, look at the drainage, um, just look at the whole, take notes, what's going on. Um, I will also link, a, a uh, checklist to help you think about all of the things that are included in that kind of wide angle view when you first get started. The next thing you're going to do is look at a whole plant, the plant as a whole. Um, so take a few steps forward. What's going on on that plant? Um, is it the upper plant tissue that's affected? Is it the lower leaves that are affected? Do you see any um, any stunting? Do you see any discoloration as a whole? So entire plant, now of course you would look at multiple plants, but as you're looking at it, not don't close in, don't look at the leaf spot, don't look at those kinds of things, the whole plant. In this image, you see some blighting of some of the leaves. Um, you see some marginal leaf scorch. You'll see, um, I see some brown stems in there. There's chlorosis overall, so you kind of see that discoloration. There are a lot of things going on. So I'm just taking a general look at the entire plant here, taking notes all along the way, taking photos all along the way to document that, to help explain to whoever's on the other end, um, to help you sort through maybe what could be happening. The next thing is you're gonna look at the ground level or the soil level or the crown of the plant. So if you're in a greenhouse or in a soilless mix, you're gonna look at the, at the crown right there where that soilless media is in the container. Um, this image is from a field. So what's happening at the ground level? Very critical, a lot of us um, tend to overlook this uh, very important component, especially as our canopy becomes dense. We never really get on our hands and knees in the field, for example, to look at what's happening at the crown. A lot of our root rots and our stem and crown pathogens are going to cause, whether it's cankers or some type of, um, some type of structure. This is southern blight, um, Athelia rolfsii, uh, previously known as Sclerotium rolfsii. Um, so it, it will actually produce a sign, right? This is the actual fungus growing there. Um, in a very rainy condition. It's not always that easy. Sometimes it's maybe a flattening of the stem at the soil line as those plant cells collapse um, when, uh, when the plant is infected by, a, for example, a Phytophthora or a Pythium root rod or a Rhizoctonia uh, crown rot. So look at that stem, see if there's anything going on, a canker or a lesion or some kind of abnormality. Always look really closely at the soil line. Very important, good habit to get into. And then finally, um, going to that leaf, going to the individual leaf or the individual bud or uh, flower and taking a closer look. 
that's when we're going to be able to describe a little bit more of um, a specific symptom. This is a leaf spot um, that is um, this is a close-up of a leaf spot and we'll see we'll see some green maybe some chlorosis around the edge we see a brown margin we see some fungal structures in the center of this one um, this is a bipolaris gigantea or hemp leaf spot or bipolaris leaf spot sometimes called so the black structures that we see there those are um, those are a fungal structure um, those are a, a macro uh, canidia for and the canidia, those are the asexual spores. But what I'm looking here is um, if I don't have good enough eyesight, and as we get older, we don't, but to have a hand lens, just a jeweler's loop that you can get um, from any online store, uh, usually around the five or $10 range, but that'll give you a 20X or a 50X magnification. And so you can really easily see some structures, but you can describe what that spot looks like. Um, so, so give a really good description. Are there fungal structures in there? Are there no fungal structures in there? You might see some other things. This is the point where you start seeing, wait a minute, I think on the underside of the leaf, I'm seeing mites or I'm seeing things that are not fungal or, or, or plant pathogens. We're seeing other things. Or um, this, this is kind of that, that, that place where you have already eliminated maybe other issues um, maybe rotting or wet soils or other things. So this is when you're starting to look at maybe where often we start. And this is number four, though, in my list. And then finally, we're going to step back. We're going to look at those images that we took and all the notes that we took and all of that, that collection of information of the site. And we're going to kind of summarize it. We're going to analyze it. What's going on? What am I looking at? What did the soil and the site look like? What did other plants, nearby plants seem like? What is the overall growth of the plant? Uh, was there stunting? Was there maybe herbicide drift or uh, phytotoxicity because I didn't rinse out my sprayer? Or um, was there maybe something happening at the crown? Maybe um, something that was not um, a disease agent? or maybe just some inconsistencies. Maybe you saw some things and it was just inconsistent and you couldn't draw any conclusions, but you're still taking notes. Those are still being added to your, your mental list. And at this point, you can usually eliminate the problem or, or identify the problem just simply by process of elimination. Um, most of the time you won't have a disease as your problem. It'll be something else. It'll be mechanical, something abiotic. Um, but if you still suspect a, a plant pathogen, then you've got your list of information in order to communicate with a consultant or a county agent or your, uh, your local university specialist. This is the time that you would move on to the plant disease diagnostic lab, prepare a sample, however your, your contact person suggests. And it's a, it's a much easier way. You're not just giving um, a leaf with, with spots, you're giving that whole site analysis. So this is, this is often needle in a haystack kind of, um, kind of evaluation. And by you doing this background work, you're pointing your diagnostician in a direction so that they ha you have already eliminated the obvious. And this gets you a diagnosis much quicker and much more accurately than before. So again, this is part one in a series of three. If you, if you choose to listen to some of the other videos, you may hear a little bit of this information repeated. And um, if you listen to this alone, I hope this can get you a little bit closer to um, eliminating things that are not disease and thinking about disease versus, um, versus the actual pathogen that causes maybe very similar symptoms. So thank you for your attention and there are quiz questions following. Thanks.